Welcome to The Dental Brief, the world's direct, right-to-the-point podcast produced to get you the information you need to learn and grow your practice. To learn more about our guests and find links to information discussed on our show, visit our website, dentalbrief.com. On to today's episode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Dental Brief. I have with me today a very special guest, uh, Emmett Scott. Say hello to our audience. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Hey, Emmett. Terrific to have you here. I'm glad you took the time out of your busy schedule to uh, meet with us, to share with our audience. Um, can't wait for today's episode. Uh, I got to ask you, you know, I know you're involved in a big organization. You've got a, a new book out, DSO Secrets, um, that our audience needs to check out. So very busy guy, but you talk to dentists all over the place. Um, and we're going to get to um, challenges that are going on in the dental industry in a moment. But first, tell us, how'd you get involved in dentistry? Yeah, I graduated in accounting, went into financial planning. I noticed that uh, that a lot of the investors were really entrepreneurs. And I always asked myself, why were they investing in other people's companies and not in their own? And I realized there was a challenge out there. Entrepreneurs don't know how to scale to be an executive. So I started a consulting firm around that, had a radio show called The Entrepreneur Life, and just fully dove into like what it meant to be an entrepreneur my best friend from the age of two calls me. He's a dentist and he wants to open a dental practice. And um, so we did something, you know, crazy as we focused on pediatric. We built the dental practice like it was a storybook called the kids back as prince or princess. They get gold coins along the way. They get crowned at the end for their bravery in dentistry. They get a balloon. They get a sticker. Mom gets a sticker because she's always freaking out. And then they get to spend their money and. We had a thousand patients in the first three weeks and we're like, wow, we have something figured out here in dental, you know, since most of dental, let's be honest, like it sucks as a product, right? Like most people don't understand the value and they understand the pain. So we were doing everything we could to make it more customer centric, started building multiple practices, um, said, oh, we got to centralize a call center billing team, start building out the executive team. Patrick, I didn't even know what a DSO was. I was just helping my buddy out, you know, and then sure. I started hearing about this DSO thing. And so started looking into that. I started a podcast called DSO Secrets. Mostly it was just to share what I was doing. Sure. And I was like, hey, if anybody has any better ideas, like here's what we're doing. And then I realized there was a much bigger industry than that. I always loved the concept of dental support organization. I feel like if you hold true to just that concept, like, what dentists wouldn't want more support, have more autonomy by not having to worry about marketing, not have to worry about HR, not have to worry about IT compliance, accounting, et cetera. So that's how we built our DSO as kind of two best friends. Like, how would you do this? Created partnership programs for our associate dentist. And then we really got focused on just underserved markets. And I'm most fascinated with entrepreneur clinicians. So you know, entrepreneur clinicians, and I cover this in my book, um, they hit what we call the dark tunnel, where it's like the only way forward is backwards. I got to hire a bunch of people and I'm going to have a bunch of expense and I got to get a regional and I got to get a COO and a CFO and all this complexity. And so we built Community Dental Partners, our DSO, to partner with entrepreneur dentists so they can skip over the dark tunnel. Uh, basically, they can just use our resources to build out their brand. And so anyway, now we have 70 locations, three different states and continue to expand throughout the U.S. And uh, yeah, all because a buddy said, hey, I want some help with my dental practice. It's funny how that happens, right? I mean, yeah. the, it's the, the stories that we hear and it's always great to ask. And it's amazing what you've done. It's amazing what your organization is doing. Um, congratulations to that. It's no easy. Well, thank feature. you. Yeah, it, it ended up expanding into pretty soon dentist entrepreneur organization ran by Jake Poole reached out and like, man, I love what you're doing on DSO Secrets. And we ended up merging uh, my interests there. So now I'm partners in DEO. And then last year, you know, ADSO is the largest association of DSOs globally. And um, the CEOs there asked if I would serve as president uh, for three years. So now I'm president of ADSO. So moral of the story is be careful about helping out your best friend. You yeah, might be so. fully involved in the industry by the time, you know, 12 years pass. So. That's that's fantastic. So, you know, you talk to a dentist all the time, right? You're talking to people that are doing great and they don't need any help. And you're talking to those that are begging for help and, you know, everywhere in between, right? So what are some of the big challenges that that is uh, making your phones ring right now? What are some of the challenges that dentists are, are facing 
um, that you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe that's uh, something new this year or last year. Yeah, I think I'm going to go maybe a little bit different than where people would think, you know, because we could talk about um, getting staff and things like that that have been on a macro basis. I think the fundamental issue is always identifying and serving the customer. And at first that seems pretty obvious, but one of the places that dentistry has struggled is everything was very centered around the doctor, not the patient initially, right? Three days a week, I'm open from nine to four o'clock, et cetera. And the rest of the world doesn't work that way. And Amazon made this 10 times worse. Like we're all just entitled and we want everything. So most of the challenge can be boiled down. Do you know who your customer is and are you serving, serving them on their terms? Now, where it gets complex pretty quickly is if you're trying to scale and grow, your customer will change on you. Meaning, yes, you still have to identify very clearly what patient customer you're taking care of, but now you have an associate customer. Do you understand that doctor's avatar, right? avatar, you know, in marketing, but like your ideal customer, do you understand what their demographic psychographic needs are? Are you building a platform that's going to serve them? Do they want to have a, a ownership someday? Do you have a platform for that? Do they want a nine to five job? Do they want to make a lot of money? Do they want a percentage of income? Like being able to serve that. And then I think this last couple of years is really focused on, do we understand our team avatar as a customer? Are we able to recruit from them? I mean, you're in marketing. Most people don't think of their HR as a marketing firm or department, yeah. sure. right? But the reality is your website tells me whether I want to work for you or not. Most of the time we think about HR as like, you know, managing and administering benefits, but how well is it really doing marketing. So I tend to look when someone says I have a problem, I tend to bucketize the customers really quickly and say, is this a is this a problem because you're not clear on who your patient customer is? Like anytime Dennis, I, I'll ask them, so who's your primary uh, customer you serve as a patient? And they'll say, I do bread and butter dentistry. I'm like, that is not the right answer. That doesn't tell me anything, right? That's like um, asking Amazon, you know, who are you trying primarily targeting? And they say, we have warehouses. You know, that doesn't right. tell you anything about what their marketing strategy is going to be. So sure. helping doctors get more clear on that, bam, everything takes off. And then yep. doing that around doctors and staff can solve, you know, 99% of your problems. Yeah, hundred percent. It's, it's, you're right on the money about that. And um, obviously, you know what you're talking about. I consider marketing every single thing that a practice does, right? Anything that any consumer faces and, and, and what you're talking about, and I agree with as well, is your employees are your consumers too, right? Yeah. So they're kind of, I consider them the first consumer. You, you got to take care of them and you got to make sure that they're happy and they're going to make sure that you're paying customers are happy and so on and so forth. So well, at a principle-based level, marketing and sales is influencing human behavior. Sure. Right? When yeah. someone says, I'm not a salesman, I'm not a marketing person. Sure. Well, you're going to have a hard time in life because you're never influencing anyone's behavior. I mean, treatment coordination is going to be pretty tough if you can never influence behavior. Yeah. Getting your staff to improve or have better outcomes is going to be tough if you're never influencing behavior. So you, I, I agree with you. It's in everything. Yeah. You're a salesperson. You're just a bad one, right? Not you yourself. <laughs> right. You're the person who says I'm not, right? Yeah. yeah, you are. You're just not very good at it, right? Salesman yeah. doesn't mean that you actually get people to buy stuff, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I was once working with the CPA who was CEO over his, his CPA firm. And he would ask the CPAs, I mean, poor accountants. He would say, hey, how good of a salesperson are you, right? And uh, the accounts would be like, I'm terrible. And he goes, well, then how are you going to influence me to give you this job? Right. <laughs> you know, so it is really in the heart. Now, I think as healthcare professionals, our concept is, no, we don't want to sell. You know, we don't want to influence. But the reality is we do. We want to influence people for the better, you know. Right. And to the extent we um, believe that what we're providing them is better, we should be trying to influence them. And same with our associates. Yeah. So I have a way in mind that you, you've done this, you know, 60 plus practices right now. So you're doing this all over the place. There's different customers in those different practices. And like you said, your associates have different customers and so on. How do, how do you recommend someone go about identifying their ideal niche market, their ideal, you know, customer? What is that? How do you, what, what process would you put someone through in order to help them get there? I'm going to make it really simple because I'm going to pretend like some of these, those listening just have one practice and some mm -hmm. have a lot of practice. 
I want you to imagine for a minute that there's a million people standing outside your practice and they all want to come to you. Okay. They're all mm -hmm. the way from like a pediatric Medicaid patient. So like zero age, all the way up to, we'll say age 100 geriatric high end needs. Okay. So full spectrum and you can divide them out however you want on what procedures and care they want, which one Patrick it, or the clinician, right? Do you want to see first? Which one do you want to see second? Which one do you want to see third and why? And there's going to be a group you frankly never want to see. And what's fun is there's another set of dentists who really want to see the ones you don't want to see. Right. And that's what creates these niches in the marketplace. So I think you've got to start there because listen, I could hire you, Patrick, to go out and sell and get me a bunch of patients. But if it's not the patient I'm not passionate about, right, then yeah. I'm not going to do the procedures. It doesn't matter if treatment coordination, got the financing figured out. At the end of the day, everything needs to center around that clinician's capabilities and what they're passionate about. That's a great place to start. Now, if you've been practicing for a while, that's going to be a lot easier. Number two is you can just go into your practice management software, divide it out by demographic and say, okay, who do we tend to attract and why? And, and what products do we tend to quote unquote, sell them, service them with, right? Yeah. Oh, wow. We do a lot of fillings. Oh, we do a lot of crowns. We do a lot of implants. We do it. We do it on this age. We tend to do better with women between 30 and, and 40, you know, whatever it might be, and then target the heck out of them and change your practice as much as possible to appeal to them. Now everyone gets nervous because then it's like, well, then Frank's not going to come in who's 75, you know, it's well, number one, good. Cause maybe you didn't want him, but number two, mm -hmm. yeah, he still will, <laughs> you know, they still come in. Cause there's something about like, when we go into a business and we can tell it's very focused on a niche, we just kind of love it. You know? Yeah, no, you're, you're hundred percent right. I tell people that all the time, you know, you know it's, it's, it's great advice. And I think, you know, you don't want to work with people you don't want to work with either. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a real yeah. thing. And they don't want to work with you. If you don't want to work with someone, they probably don't want to work with you either. So why don't we avoid the heartache and pain? Right. It's like, um, just, you know, it's like a marriage, right. Um, it's not much different than that. So let me ask you this question and this is kind of loaded and I'm hoping that you challenge me on this. Um, cause obviously, you know, that's where we all grow is through challenges. Um, I tell a lot, of, I tell startups oftentimes when they start talking about, you know, PPOs and they start talking about Medicaid and whatever. And I agree with you hundred percent on choose your niche audience, define it, choose it, create your messaging specific for that audience. But I also tell people when you get going, get busy as fast as possible, whatever that looks like, and then start to, um, start to, you know, narrow that net down, if you will, right. So that, to make that pond a little bit smaller, um, to get that person that you want in there only what's wrong with that. Well, the, the difficulty is going to be like how well you service those patients. W if you're trying to do everything from Medicaid to fee for service, it's such a different experience. And, you know, technically, like if that's where you start and it gets your revenue going great, but you and I both know as fast as possible, you're going to want to niche one way or the other. Of course. And if, especially if you're taking Medicaid which we do in a lot of our practices, especially around pediatric, you're, you're dancing with the devil there. You've got to have your compliance and your billing processes. You don't make billing mistakes with that insurance. You do fraud, waste and abuse, right? So it's sure. very intense. You're, you tend to have a customer on Medicaid that, you know, they're not coming out of pocket. And, and so, and they want everything done ideally same day for them taking off of work and all of that stuff is a bigger deal. They're willing to have a longer wait time. When you get up into your PPO and fee for service, they don't want the wait time. They're also more likely to show up for their appointments. So the show rate goes up. So you can, you can throw that big net, but man, your systems are going to be all over the place trying to service it. And what typically happens is you start getting rid of like the no show type appointments. If you're going to go Medicaid, you got to be double, triple booking. You got to be operationally prepared to do same day, those kind of things. So, you know, you're just going to find yourself to be successful. You're going to have to niche quickly. Sure. Yeah. And I totally agree with you that I just and doctors are humans and, you know, they can't just switch from building red trucks to doing blue motorcycles either. There's such a different experience with each kind of customer type. You know, going from pediatric to geriatric, we've got to be realistic on like what load that puts on a dentist. 
Sure. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense to me. Um, let me let me kind of ask you this this um, this last question. If somebody's considering working with a DSO, right? They think, hey, this is a good opportunity for them, whether they're an associate somewhere right now and they want to get involved that way or they have a practice and they, they, they think maybe going the DSO route is right for them. Tell me, how do you look for the right partner? How do you look for, I know your, your website, by the way, I'm going to put it out there right now. It's communitydentalpartners.com, but what are, what are some things that you think they should look for? So I love the saying, I can give a man anything he wants. The hard part is for him to define what he wants. So step number one, like figure out what you want for your career. I, I think dentists have been too nervous that DSOs are going to take advantage of them rather than realizing they have all this opportunity now, right? Basically, you have all these suitors who think you're the prettiest girl trying to figure out how best to serve you. You've got to know what you're looking for. What do you want out of your career? What do you want in your personal development, clinical capability? Get clear on that and then just go find the organization that's going to match. We work really well with entrepreneurial dentists, right? So if you're like nine to five, kind of want to work part time, we're probably not the right one. If you're getting ready to retire, we're probably not the right one, right? That's a heartland. There, there's a lot of great organizations out there that really understand how to take care of that doctor. If you're building an organization out, let's say you're at three, five, 10 locations. And you're like, man, I'm stuck. Like I need a superpower to help me scale this. I'm excited about getting more clear on my brand, having more impact. Like that's us. If you're an associate dentist where you're like, I want to own a, a practice someday, but I want a powerhouse behind me. That's us. So we're very focused on like the entrepreneurial dentist. And then I think there's groups for others as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Last thing I want to tell our readers about your book. I haven't read it. It is going to be the next book that I start. Um, and finish. I don't start a book without uh, finishing it. I, about five years ago, I read the statistics on that. And now every single book I start, I, I finish it. So I want to make that clear, um, but I'm going to read it. Um, it's been fascinating having you here. I want to tell our audience about your book too. It's DSO Secrets. They can get it. Your website, Amazon. Where yeah, the Amazon. The Ultimate Guide to Building Your Dental Empire works for single dentists, um, even associates. It'll give you some great tips. And then those who are trying to scale into group practices or even a DSO. Yeah, check it out. Emmett Scott, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on today's episode. Did you know you can weigh in on today's topic on Facebook? Search The Dental Brief on Facebook or visit our website, dentalbrief.com, and just follow the link. We look forward to having you join us again on another episode of The Dental Brief.